Hello everyone, I'm Priya Rao with Vine Roots and I'm really excited today to speak with David Patterson, who's the winemaker of Tantalus, located in the Okanagan. We're talking today about climate change as we approach Earth Day and I was uh, really interested to, to talk to you, David, because I know that BC has been really at the forefront of, of dealing with this, especially in the last few years where you've experienced such extreme temperature variations. So let's mm -hmm. start off there with, um, I mean, we're just coming out of a very severe winter here in Ontario. What was it like for you out in the Okanagan? Yeah, pretty severe as well. I mean, the overall i'd say precipitation was average the snowfall was around average i mean i, I really only get that off what the ski hill was like for the for the winter mm -hmm. um average to low really um the we we hit some of the lowest temperatures we've ever seen uh at minus 27 on our site um degrees centigrade which is incredibly cold. Uh, vines don't like that at all. So we are expecting a lot of damage within our vineyard this year from that uh, cold snap around Christmas. Mm -hmm. That was one sort of Arctic uh, flow extreme. Um, the rest of it has been not mild, a little colder than maybe the, the 10 or 12 year average. But apart from that one dip, it, it wasn't too severe. But mm -hmm. because of that, little dip in uh, around Christmas um, to those below minus 20 um, extreme temperatures we uh, in in the far farming overall is uh, is affected but great grapes in particular uh, really don't like it when it goes below minus 20 so we won't really know the effects until bud break uh, in late April early May so we're fingers crossed that we get something but uh, and, and the vines didn't die mm -hmm. um, but yeah, very, very worrying for sure. And previous to this year, or maybe even the last few years, what would a an average uh, winter be like in the Okanagan? What's the, generally speaking, the lowest the temperature would have gone? I mean, we always see some sort of event in J January or February where we see minus 15, maybe minus 17. And, you know, that's fairly normal, but to see that, you know, extra five to 10 degrees below that, that kind of event, it's hopefully a, an anomaly, but it, it seems like we're seeing, you know, hotter temperatures in summer and colder temperatures in winter, uh, you know, bigger uh, fluctuation in temperature, which, uh, you know, is, is very concerning. So, with that kind of a uh, five degree temperature shift, it doesn't sound like a lot to to a lot of us who, you know, if you're skiing mm -hmm. or if you're just enjoying the weather, five degrees doesn't sound like something that would create so much more damage. So what is happening in that change? Like if the vines are used to the sort of that minus 15, minus 18, mm -hmm. what is this extra five degrees doing? Well, so basically when, we, when we're talking about damage, um, you're talking, about the the buds that would then create the new shoots that would have fruit to make wine um, on, and they are they are a little bit prone out of the out of the cane, um, so susceptible to those temperatures, and there's just a few cells right at the tip of that bud called the growing tip, um, very you know self-explanatory. And if those cells are damaged, they rupture from those extreme cold, that, that extreme cold, they freeze and rupture, mm -hmm. well, then they can't reproduce and start the growing piece. So they, in fact, die and oxidize. And so when we cut into these uh, buds and have a look, we see black uh, buds rather than uh, green buds because all of the, essentially the guts of those cells have, have ruptured and then oxidized. Um, so that's how we can tell that we have damage. And minus 15 is still pretty extreme. I mean, it's not, uh, you know, it's plants don't really like it that cold because you've got expansion of water as it freezes and the colder it gets, the further that expands. So you're swelling everything that has any water in it. Luckily, vines and, and other plants, they go dormant over winter to, to protect themselves against 
that anomaly. Um, so most of the moisture in the plant has gone down into the roots underground. And then that's where the energy in the spring comes from is that push out of the, out of the root system. But there is still some moisture left over um, in that process. And if that then expands, then we can, we can get to the point of trunks cracking um, in the vines, uh, which then allows disease uh, into it or, or obstructs the, the cambium or the xylem and phloem. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the structures in the plant that, that allow flow of either photosynthate once they're growing or the, the, the stored carbohydrates that are in the roots um, pushing out in the spring. So um, although five degrees might not be a lot for, for a lot of things, um, when we're already at minus 15, we're on that edge and then you do another five to seven degrees, now we're at minus 22, then that bud hardiness um, is, is gone. Right. And is there anything that can be done to protect them from that kind of cold? Um, I mean, not right then and there. There, there, there are some techniques. A lot of people talk about, uh, you know, frost fans. Well, mm -hmm. frost fans are really only effective right in spring. So let's say we have a, the, the little green shoots come out and then we get a minus two, minus three event. Well, all of that very sensitive green tissue is incredibly full of water. And again, we get that bursting of the cells and then the killing of the growing tip. Um, so at that stage, when you are moving air around with a fan or spraying water onto the, the plants um, through the overhead irrigation, you get a latent point of freezing. So in fact, the, the bud never freezes, just the water around it freezes and it, and it uh, insulates or the air is moving. So it never actually gets to that minus one half degree centigrade where you can start seeing damage. So they're very effective in that. But when you're talking minus 20, there's no other warm air to move around. You know, <laughs> you're moving minus 20 air around. It yeah. doesn't really matter. Um, so you know, when you look at, say, Prince Edward County, mm -hmm. they have set themselves up right from the start when they started creating their region to bury the vines. Yeah. So their structure of their vine is very different. The trunk is only you know, maybe 12 inches out of the ground, and then they're, they're having canes come out of the head of that plant up into the trellis system. And then as soon as they've finished picking, they're in fact pruning bringing those canes back down and then hilling earth up over those canes because they know they're going to hit those minus 25s every exactly. year. Well, the entire Okanagan's not set up that way. And so could we do something, i.e. set that up? Sure, but that would take probably forty dollars or $50,000 worth of work per acre. Um, so essentially re-establishing and redoing the entire trellis system the, and, and the entire vine architecture. Mm -hmm. So is that doable? Sure. Um, but that's going to put a lot of people out of business. Um, if we if we get to the point where every winter we're seeing these extreme events, then we're going to have to rethink what we're doing and how we're doing it and redo, redo a lot of things. We also have a very different soil structure to a Prince Edward County or Niagara. And we have a very silty loam here. So if we were, we actually practice uh, regenerative agriculture on our site, um, which means we're not tilling the earth at all. We're doing no-till no seed drilling and cover crops and basically the exact opposite to what you would need to do if we were trying to hill up because mm -hmm. at that stage, then you're plowing the earth twice a year, um, which when you've got high clay content and uh, you know calcareous clays like you do in the um, in Prince Edward County, that, uh, that soil structure works. They're also on fairly flat they've got some slopes but one or two degrees not not the extreme slopes that we see in, in our valley and so the erosion um potential there is a lot less because you you have a big rainfall you're not going to wash all that soil right off the side in one degree slopes but in our slopes which is a, a lot more severe all over the okanagan if we were plowing everything in and then we had a big rain event in spring when there was no cover crop on, we would lose all of our topsoil off into the gully. So there's those factors to think of as well. Right. Uh, wow. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've talked to a lot of the winemakers in county and it does take a lot of extra manpower and of course resources, financial resources to hill up and then, you mm -hmm. know, unbury at every spring. It's just a, every spring. Yeah. Yeah, so let's hope that it is an anomaly and that 
weather patterns manage to even themselves out but in the meantime let's move on to spring and summer because i know that as much as we've had extreme cold in the winters you guys have had some really extreme temperatures to the other end of the mm -hmm. spectrum as well and you know add on to that the the wildfires that happen and the the sizes of those fires now what what are those what is the combination of the extreme heat in the summer plus the fires what is that doing to the vineyards well it's i mean that's a very complex question that we're all trying to solve um firstly you know we, we are seeing well last year was the anomaly really um for the for the extreme heats we, we we always see around 40 degrees centigrade at some stage during the summer and the vines are fairly used to that they they're, they're quite uh adaptable um so they they close their stomata they stop uh photosynthesizing uh during the day so they're conserving water and then they they will do what's called c4 photosynthesis where they they're basically storing the the sunlight energy during the day and then they open their stomata to get the co2 to complete photosynthesis uh in in the cooler evenings um so they go into that kind of cycle um but we, we usually only see one or two days around that 40 degrees and then we're more in the 32 to 35 which is fairly good for grapes um but last year last summer we saw the the, the heat dome that everyone's talking about um which you know was the, the hottest i've ever been in i i recorded 48 and a half uh, degrees in my car um and uh, in fact my car showed 49 but i was on on tarmac so that you can't really say that it was quite that hot but it was it was really hot um and that lasted we were well over 40 degrees for over a week and i i think what, what the effect of that was not necessarily too damaging to the plant overall mm -hmm. they just shut down and don't do anything basically and conserve any water that they have and we were irrigating a lot through that to make sure that they had enough moisture so we didn't see any collapse in vines and that that was great um those temperatures powdery mildew which is our biggest sort of thing that we battle in the vineyards there all the spores die at that temperature so you know try and see a silver lining we didn't have to spray as much because mm -hmm. there was no need to lots of airflow and lots of heat um however that particular heat dome came right at the wrong time so um and when i say right at the wrong time what i'm meaning is it was right when the grapes were going through cell division so basically they are deciding how big they could get as they then fill with sugar and, and water and so that just meant that we ended up with very very small berries because with that heat right at cell division time very little cell division happened in the berries and so then as the berries are trying to size up and go through the raison and go into their next stages of uh, development, there just wasn't the potential for the berries to get any bigger because they hadn't done done what they're supposed to in that uh, in that freakish heat. Um, we we saw in the Similkamine Valley a little further south from us. Um, they had been through cell division they're always about a week or two ahead of us so they'd already been through cell division before that heat dome then they shut down but then once they came to sizing up and ripening because they'd already been through cell division it was a marked difference i got some grapes from the similkamine and the size of those grapes versus the size up here was was over double so where we where, where we had the amount of clusters of grapes to get three three and a half tons to the acre which is what we're always looking for. Basically, we had the, the we had the right bunch count. It still took us just as long to snip every bunch off the plant, but they all weighed very little because they had no potential. Where when we went down to Smilkamine, they were at that three and a half, four tons to the acre because their berries had sized up. So that's really where that heat hurt us. Um, so timing of heat's going to be, I, I think we're always going to see some fairly extreme heats these days, but I mean, you look at say arizona's growing grapes they get really really hot but as long as it doesn't happen in that very key either flowering or cell division time then the plants can handle that um 
it is meaning that we're seeing more forest fires, which you touched on. Um, I think that unless a fire is right next to your vineyard, right in your vineyard and burning it to the ground, like we saw in uh, Adelaide Hills last year, um, there was a huge amount of Adelaide Hills sort of heritage vineyard that was burnt to the stump. Um, so as long as we don't see that right in a vineyard, which we, which we haven't really seen yet in, in the Okanagan, um, really what, what affects us is the, uh, is the smoke and, and smoke mm. taint or smoke effect. Um, and that, that's something that's been widely researched all over the world in different restaurant, uh, restaurants in different um, universities. To, to work out how to mitigate that when we're making wine. Um, it's not something that the plant's gonna be able to mitigate. It just, it doesn't really harm the plant, to be honest. I mean, plant's functionality is to turn sunlight and CO2 into, into carbohydrate um, at, its, at its essence. Um, and so it'll slow down that process when there's a blanket of smoke, mainly because not as much sunlight is getting through to allow that photosynthesis. So the smoke just slows the process down, but doesn't really harm the plant overall. And it doesn't stay systemically in the plant. Mm -hmm. um, what it does is it pushes it into its reproductive structure, the grape. And that's why we see those compounds then coming into the wine. Um, so the cresols, the guaiacols, all these uh, the smoky compounds that, uh, that are not very nice in wine when you when your wine smells like barbecue sauce or uh, or wet ashtray or. <laughs> I mean, it might complement a barbecue meal, but uh, yeah, that's definitely not what you want. Yeah, I don't know. A, a glass of cold barbecue sauce doesn't sound very appealing. No. Um, so that's really where where the where the effect of these fires uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, works in the wine industry is the is the taint that can happen in wine from. Uh, prolonged exposure to to smoke. Now, a lot of what you've been talking um, about is yeah. sorry. No, no, no. Carry on. Yeah. A lot of what you've been talking about has been pretty scientific in terms of how the different aspects of the temperatures and and the smoke mm -hmm. has affected what's going on in the in the plant itself. Now, what about what you're doing in the vineyards? Because I know you've been talking about cover crops and in irrigation. So. Cover crops is an interesting one because some vineyards, you know, a lot of vineyards across the world, they have no cover crops at all. It's just the sandy soil mm -hmm. or whatever their their soil type is and then just the vines. But what type of cover crops are you using out there? Um, many different species. Um, it comes back to our philosophy of uh, the idea that we are growing a, an entire ecosystem of which yeah. grapes happen to be what you know, for want of a better term, our cash crop or what, what we are making a business out of, but we, we grow an entire ecosystem um, on this farm, including, you know, the many different species of cover crop, um, different legumes, different uh, nitrogen fixes, different, uh, you know, species that add different micronutrients to the soil and, and ultimately add organic matter to the soil as they grow and then break down. Mm -hmm. um, uh, improves the structure of the soil, improves the porosity and therefore the drainability of the soil. So when we get extreme weather events that come through, because we're in a mountainous valley, um, the vineyard can can handle the, the a deluge of rain far better than, than if it's just plowed in and, and it's a monoculture. And uh, we, we plant uh, bee friendly species as well. We have a lot of uh, bees on site. Um, and obviously when we are spraying our vines, um, you know, we, we grow with organics in mind, um, but we grow in a sustainable manner. Mm -hmm. And um, no, no grape growing can be done without some sort of spray, but we are using organic methods. Um, but we make sure that those sprays are not harmful to, to bees and other insects. So my grapes come in alive with all sorts of little critters on them and and uh, and we like seeing that because we want to see that biodiversity mm -hmm. i think when you have a biodiverse farm then nothing ever fully takes over i mean last year we saw whole vineyards just decimated with uh, leaf hopper for example um because of the which is what 
a leafhopper is a small parasitic uh, fly, basically, that sucks the chloroform out of leaves. So it turns the leaves brown. And then obviously the, the plant can't photosynthesize anywhere near as well. It doesn't kill the plant, but again, it, it hinders ripening of grapes. So we saw small patches in our field, but we didn't see the whole field get decimated. And we saw some more conventional farms uh, around us and further south that, that their entire vineyard just got like turned brown and got decimated by um, these, these leafhoppers. And our, it is our belief that because we have so many different insect species and so, many, so much biodiversity, nothing can really ever take over and become its own monoculture because there is so much diversity within the farm. So that's, that's one of the main reasons to do it. And then, and then the cover crops are not only a haven for these insects, but also uh, regenerating the soil um, in a natural way and not using any salt fertilizers, um, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, um, which, you know, there's, there's many, uh, many documentaries, many books written on, on that topic of, of how in the last 40 years, humans have tried to get more and more yield out of, out of pieces of land through, through non-sustainable means. And, and by that, we mean that the soil is going to be dead in the next generation if we don't regenerate it and, and farm like our great grandparents used to when, right. The uh, the big uh, the big chemical companies didn't uh, didn't exist at that stage, um, so people have taken the easy route both with genetically modifying crops and with uh, false fertilizers. I call them false fertilizers because they're not doing anything to the soil. They're putting the plant on steroids. So yes, it grows bigger, it grows quickly, but what about all the soil biome, the fungi, the, all the things that connect a, a piece of land and a, and a piece of soil um, to itself that has, that's gone by the wayside and, mm -hmm. and, and generally in farming. And if we think we've, we're starting to see food shortage now, you wait 20 years if we don't get our act together as humans to uh, start regenerating soil and stop the, uh, stop the, the conventional way of farming, the easy way out is not the right way. Yeah, I mean, it's it's amazing to me that Mother Nature man, manages to hold on because we're certainly mm. doing everything we can to to give her, you know, her money's worth. Like she's, you talk about the vines and how they'll just shut down in extreme heat and, you know, they're just trying to protect themselves. They can, they find ways to protect themselves and to just carry on. But boy, we're, uh, we're really giving them a hard time out there. Thanks so much, David. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Great chat. Cheers.